The Abu Ghraib pictures tell a sordid tale of torture. Prisoners stacked naked in a pyramid, handcuffed on the ground, dragged by a leash, and attached to electrical wires. Throughout history, certain photos have captured humanity at its most depraved, shining a harsh light on the darkest moments. These powerful images have served as sparks, igniting uprisings and fueling revolutions, forcing the world to confront its own cruelty and demand change. These are the 10 most disturbing photos that changed the world forever. Number 10. Rodare's Story Roadair, captured in a photograph, is a young woman from a farming family who had a serious mental breakdown after she was threatened with accusations of witchcraft. This threat deeply unsettled her and led to a significant emotional and psychological crisis. Roa Dare's story is almost too sad and shocking to believe. She was a real person, born into a wealthy farming family. As a teenager, she dated a boy from a nearby farm. His family didn't approve of their relationship, and the boy's mother even threatened to put a curse on Roa if she continued seeing her son. This threat was so distressing that it led Roa to a mental breakdown. She became convinced that a spirit named Old Scratch was tormenting her. Eventually, Roa ended up in the Adams County Poorhouse, a dreadful place where she spent 40 years. At first, she lived in a basket lined with straw and received minimal care from the staff. She would sit with her knees pulled up to her chest for so long that she lost the ability to move her legs. Later, she was moved to a wooden box where she had to share space with nesting vermin. In her distress, she scratched her own eyes until she went blind and even punched out her teeth. Eventually, she stopped all these actions. Number 9. Abu Ghraib Prison Photos The Abu Ghraib facility, a large prison in Baghdad, Iraq, became infamous during Saddam Hussein's rule for holding and torturing political prisoners. In 2003, after the U.S. invaded Iraq, the prison was reopened by the U.S. military. Later that year, the Associated Press exposed the mistreatment of prisoners under U.S. control, and by 2004, shocking images of abuse and torture emerged, leading to a scandal for then-President George W. Bush's administration. An internal investigation led by Army General Antonio Taguba in 2004 uncovered horrifying practices at Abu Ghraib, one of the most gruesome images showed U.S. Army specialists giving a thumbs up next to the body of Manadel al-Jamadi, who had been tortured to death by suffocation. KC International, a defense contractor hired to provide interrogation services at Abu Ghraib, and L3 Services, responsible for translation services, became central to the scandal. With not enough trained interrogators, the U.S. military had to rely on these companies whose employees were later accused of encouraging, directing, and covering up acts of torture. In 2008, four former detainees sued these contractors for their involvement in the torture at Abu Ghraib. The abuses they suffered included physical and sexual assault, electric shocks, mock executions, and more. The Taguba report detailed incidents like rape, photographing and videotaping naked detainees, and the use of extreme force, highlighting that the torture was not just physical, but also emotional and psychological. For example, one prisoner was forced into thanking Jesus for his life. One of the plaintiffs in the 2028 lawsuit described being subjected to electric shocks, deprived of food, and kept naked. Another plaintiff described being forced into sexual acts and seeing the rape of a female prisoner. Other brutal acts included solitary confinement, sensory deprivation, stress positions, and genital beatings. On June 9, 2024, a group of 256 former detainees from Abu Ghraib filed a case against CACI and L3 services. The defendant companies argued that the case was a political issue that couldn't be decided by the courts and claimed immunity as government contractors. However, the court dismissed their motion in June 2026. By September 2009, the court ruled in favor of the defendant companies. And although the plaintiffs appealed, the U.S. Supreme Court decided in 2011 not to hear the appeal. On June 30, 2028, 
Four other plaintiffs filed a separate lawsuit against CACI International Inc. They claimed that KCI employees didn't directly carry out the torture, but instructed soldiers to soften detainees, knowing it would lead to torture. The lawsuit, filed under the 17189 Alien Tort Statute ATS, aimed to hold the company accountable for violations of human rights, including torture, assault, and negligent hiring. KCI has continuously denied the allegations, calling the lawsuit baseless and attempting 18 times to have it dismissed. While L3 Services and former SACI employee Timothy Dugan were removed from the case in 2008, SACI appealed a 2019 decision favoring the plaintiffs. However, on June 2021, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear KCI's appeal bringing the company closer to facing a trial set for April 2024. In 2004, in response to the scandal, the U.S. Justice Department announced plans to rewrite its interrogation guidelines, and the CIA temporarily suspended its use of controversial techniques until clearer rules were set. Under the Obama administration in 2009, torture was officially banned, and a new legal framework was introduced to hold perpetrators accountable regardless of their employment status with the government or military contractors. The Abu Ghraib prison was handed over to Iraqi authorities in 2006 and was shut down in 2014. Some survivors of the abuse received a limited settlement from the private security firm responsible for translation services, but the U.S. military itself has not compensated any detainees. Number 8. The Vulture and the Child, Sudan the photograph titled The Vulture and the Little Girl is often seen as one of the most heartbreaking images ever taken. It shows a weak, starving child, seemingly close to death, with a vulture nearby, as if waiting for the child to die. This powerful photograph was taken by Kevin Carter, a South African photographer, during his coverage of the Second Sudanese Civil War. The image later won the Pulitzer Prize, but few people know the full story behind it. Contrary to what many think, the child in the photograph was not a girl, but a young boy named Kong Nyong. He and his family were fleeing the violence of the Second Sudanese Civil War, which had forced millions to leave their homes. The war started because the Sudanese government enforced Sharia law in the mostly Christian South, and because of the discovery of oil in the area, leading to terrible acts on both sides as civilians tried to survive. In 1989, the United Nations started Operation Lifeline Sudan to provide food and help to those affected by the conflict, no matter their political side. Kevin Carter was sent to Sudan to show the terrible conditions, hoping to raise global awareness and support for the operation. Known for his brave coverage of apartheid's cruelty, Carter went into Sudanese villages, witnessing the extreme suffering of the people. While in Sudan, Carter was taken to a village called Ayod, where a UN feeding station was set up. There, he took pictures of crowds of starving people desperate for food. After taking these images, Carter wandered into the nearby bush where he heard quiet sobs. Following the sound, he found Kong Nyong, very thin and weak, trying to crawl toward the feeding station. Carter started taking pictures of the boy, and as he did, a vulture, which had been eating from a pile of manure, landed about 20 meters behind the child, creating the chilling scene captured in the photograph. Hoping for an even more dramatic shot, Carter waited for the vulture to spread its wings, but it never did. After a few minutes, realizing he wouldn't get the shot he wanted, Carter chased the bird away and sat under a tree, overwhelmed with emotion. He later admitted to another photographer that although he had taken an incredible photo, he couldn't stop thinking about his child suffering in such a way. The photograph was published in the New York Times in March 1993 and quickly won the Pulitzer Prize. It sparked a wave of concern for the child's fate, leading to a follow-up editorial that reported Kong Nyong had recovered enough to continue his journey to the feeding station after the vulture was chased away. However, the piece didn't confirm whether he survived. In reality, Kong Nyong did reach the feeding station and survived the famine, 
living another 14 years before sadly dying of malaria-induced fevers. Number 7. The Last Jew in Venezia. The Last Jew in Venezia is a powerful and haunting photograph from the Holocaust in Ukraine. It shows a Jewish man, likely on July 28, 1941, in the town of Berdichiv, not Venezia as often thought, kneeling beside a mass grave filled with bodies. In the image, a Nazi SS officer from the mobile death squad Einsatzgruppe D is about to execute him, while a group of SS and Reich labor servicemen coldly look on. This photo was likely taken sometime between 1941 and 1943, during the German occupation of the Venezia region. During this dark period, many Jews were brutally murdered in this region, including in the town of Venezia itself, where massacres occurred in September 1941 and April 1942. Those who survived these events were sent to labor camps, and the Jewish quarter of Yerusalemka was largely destroyed. The men in the photograph are wearing summer uniforms, which suggests it wasn't taken in the winter. This photograph resurfaced in 1961 when United Press International UPI shared it during the trial of Adolf Eichmann. UPI received the image from Al Moss, a Polish Jew who had obtained it in May 1945, shortly after being liberated from the Allah concentration camp by the American Third Army. Moss, who lived in Chicago in 1961, wanted the world to see the horrors of Eichmann's era. UPI's copy of the photograph was published as a full-page image in the foreword. Over time, different sources have provided different details about the photograph's origins. Some claim the image came from a Nazi's photo album, or was found on a dead soldier, with the words, Last Jew in Venezia" written on the back, a title that has since become widely associated with the image. Several individuals have even contacted the German newspaper, Die Welt, claiming to recognize the shooter as a relative. In January 2024, Die Welt published a study by historian Jürgen Matthäus, who concluded that the photograph was indeed taken on July 28, 1941, at the citadel of Berdichiv. Another photograph from the same event also mentions Berdichiv further confirming the location and date. This photograph has become an iconic and deeply significant image of the Holocaust. It is unusual among famous Holocaust photographs because it was taken during the events, not afterward, and likely by someone involved in the atrocities. It also captures a single, isolated victim rather than a large group, making it a stark and personal representation of the Holocaust's horrors. Number six. The Tamasat University Massacre, Thailand. In a photo by Neil Ulick, a member of a political group is seen hitting the lifeless body of a student who was hanged. On October 6, 1976, a violent crackdown occurred at Tamasat University in Thailand. This attack was carried out by the Thai police and right-wing militia groups against leftist and pro-democracy protesters, including workers and students. These protesters were rallying against the return of the ousted military dictator, Field Marshal Thanin Krivichian. The protesters also faced hostility from pro-monarchy groups. What started as a protest quickly turned into a massacre, with dozens killed and many more tortured. The background to this tragedy involves Field Marshal Thanin Krivichian, who had been a key military leader in Thailand. He led a coup in 1957 and took over as prime minister in 1963. His government was known for its corruption, favoritism, and strong support for the U.S. during the Vietnam War. He was overthrown in 1973 due to mass protests led by students demanding democratic reforms. Although Thanin fled, the country soon saw weak governments that favored conservative policies and calls for his return grew as communist forces advanced in nearby regions. In December 1976, two labor activists who opposed Thanin were murdered by local police officers. This act of violence sparked anger and protests against Thanin's possible return. On October 6, 1976, police and right-wing paramilitaries began their assault on Thammasat University. The police used heavy weapons, 
including machine guns and grenades, while paramilitary groups joined the attack. They stormed the university, blocked all exits, and brutally attacked the students. The violence included beatings, shootings, and lynchings. The police and paramilitary forces were responsible for many of these brutal acts. Some students who tried to escape were captured and severely beaten. The media played a role in escalating the violence by spreading false claims about the students being heavily armed and plotting a communist uprising. By the end of the day, the Thai military staged a coup, using the chaos at the university as a reason to take control. A pro-royalist government was set up, reversing the democratic gains made in 1973. Field Marshal Thanon kept his promise to stay out of politics, but abandoned his monk's robe soon after. Despite a memorial at the university, the events of October 6, 1976, are often explained or referred to as unclear, and no one has ever been charged for the violence. This tragic event highlights the dangers of extreme polarization and the consequences of allowing militant forces to dictate political conflicts. The brutality of October 6, 1976 is a representation of the impact of hatred and the need for vigilance against the dangers of unchecked power. Number 5. Execution of a Viet Cong Prisoner, Vietnam. In 1968, Associated Press photographer Eddie Adams took a powerful and controversial photo during the Tet Offensive of the Vietnam War. The image shows South Vietnamese Brigadier General Nguyen Ngoch Lone shooting Viet Cong Captain Nguyen Van Lem near the An Quang Pagoda in Saigon. The next day, American news media widely published the photograph, which won Adams the Pulitzer Prize for Spot News Photography in 1969. On the morning the photo was taken, NBC and AP news crews arrived at the An Quang Pagoda, but by noon, they hadn't found anything newsworthy and were getting ready to leave. An ABC cameraman was also there. This time, Lem, who was in civilian clothes, was captured by ARVN Marines and brought to the location where the journalists were. The journalists noticed him, and both NBC and ABC cameramen began filming. General Lone ordered a Marine to execute Lem, but the Marine hesitated. So, Lone took out his 38 Special Smith & Wesson revolver and shot Lem himself. The ABC cameraman, frightened by the scene, stopped filming, but Adams continued and captured the moment Lem was shot with the bullet still inside his head. Lem collapsed, bleeding heavily. Lone then explained his actions to the journalists, mentioning the deaths of Americans and South Vietnamese. A Marine placed a propaganda leaflet on Lem's face and his body was left in the street before being buried in a mass grave. In a 1972 interview, Lone told Harper's Magazine that he killed Lem because he believed Lem had killed a police officer and showed disrespect to his captors. In the 1980s, a story surfaced claiming that Lem had murdered a police major and his family who were close to General Lone. Eddie Adams supported this story though he admitted he didn't have a picture of the murders. By 2008, another version emerged, suggesting Lem had killed the family of a different officer, Lieutenant Colonel Nguyen Tuan. Historian Ed Moise thinks this may have been South Vietnamese propaganda, and historian Max Hastings said the truth may never be fully known. The photo quickly gained widespread attention in the U.S. It was featured in most American newspapers the following day, and seen by 20 million viewers on NBC's The Huntley Brinkley Report that evening. The image sparked significant discussion and commentary among various organizations and politicians. Many believe the photo greatly influenced American public opinion against the war, though historian David Perlmutter found little evidence to support this claim. Number 4. The Boy with His Dead Brother, Japan The photograph known as The Boy Standing by the Crematory is a powerful and moving image taken in Nagasaki, Japan, on September 1945, shortly after the city was devastated by an atomic bomb on August 9, 1945. Captured by photojournalist Joseph O'Donnell, who worked for the United States Marine Corps, the photo shows a 10-year-old Japanese boy carrying his deceased baby brother on his back while waiting at the crematorium. 
In the photograph, the boy is barefoot and wears a tense expression. He straps his lifeless brother, who is positioned as if he were merely sleeping, with the baby's head tilted back. The boy stands still for several minutes, watching as men in white masks remove the rope from the baby's body. These men then place the body on the cremation pyre. Throughout the process, the boy remains upright and motionless, his lower lip bitten so hard that it bleeds. As the flames gradually consume his brother's body, the boy eventually turns and walks away silently. Joseph O'Donnell, the photographer, was known for capturing the immediate aftermath of the atomic bombings in Nagasaki and Hiroshima in 1945 and 1946. Born in Johnstown, Pennsylvania in 1922, O'Donnell's photograph of the boy by the crematory is among his most renowned works. Despite his significant contributions, there was some controversy over his claims to other photos that were taken by other photographers, such as a 1943 image of Churchill and Stalin in Tehran, a place O'Donnell was not known to have visited. Despite the debates surrounding O'Donnell, the boy standing by the crematory remains an important historical artifact, symbolizing the profound human suffering caused by the atomic bombings. In 1979, Yashitoshi Fukuhori, who had been near the bombings and was deeply affected by the events, began efforts to identify the boy in the photograph. His investigation did not succeed, but Masanori Muroka, who believed he might recognize the boy as a childhood friend, also attempted to uncover the boy's identity. Despite his detailed research, Maroka's efforts also did not yield results. To this day, the boy's identity remains unknown, but his image endures as a powerful symbol of the immense human cost of the atomic bombings and the ongoing need for peace and nuclear disarmament. Number 3. David Kirby's Last Moments – AIDS Crisis David Lawrence Kirby was an American activist for HIV-AIDS awareness. He became widely known due to a photograph taken by Therese Frere on his deathbed. This photo was featured in Life magazine and was called the Picture That Changed the Face of AIDS. In the photograph, Kirby is shown nearing death with a vacant expression on his face. His father is seen holding his head with visible sorrow while other family members sit nearby. Life magazine published the photo in its November 1990 issue and it quickly gained national and international attention. The image was later used by the clothing brand United Colors of Benetton in an ad campaign, with Kirby's family's permission. They believed the ad would help show the severe impact of AIDS. While at Pater Noster House, a hospice for people with AIDS, Kirby developed a connection with Therese Frere, a college student from Ohio University who was there for a school project. Frere was shadowing a caregiver named Peta, who was also HIV positive and had built a close relationship with Kirby and his family. Because of this bond, Kirby agreed to let Frere take photos of him in his declining state, as long as the pictures would not be used for profit. When Kirby's condition worsened, Frere was invited by the family to document his final moments and their grief. They hoped that the images would help others understand the pain of losing a loved one to AIDS, when Life published the photo, it shocked many people in the United States with its raw depiction of the disease. While the public knew AIDS was deadly, many only understood it abstractly. The image challenged the misconception that AIDS only affected gay men and helped people empathize with the family's loss. Despite some complaints about its graphic nature, Life magazine believed it was important for showing real-life stories of life and death. The photo also won second place in the 1991 World Press Photo General News Contest. After the Life publication, the Kirby family allowed United Colors of Benetton to use the image in a 1992 ad campaign, believing it would reach a global audience. However, the campaign faced criticism from various sources, including the Catholic Church, which felt the image was an inappropriate reference to religious imagery. The photo brought the AIDS crisis into the public eye and highlighted issues of patient rights and ethics. It helped the AIDS Action Now movement by exposing the political and societal issues related to the disease. 
advocates for AIDS patients pushed for rights and autonomy in medical research and treatment. In 2012, Frere shared that David's father, Bill Kirby, expressed the family's view on the Benetton ad campaign. He said, listen, Therese, Benetton didn't use us or exploit us. We used them. Because of them, your photo was seen all over the world, and that's exactly what David wanted. Number two, Rwandan genocide. A photo from the 1994 Rwandan genocide shows the bloody feet of Tutsi children trying to escape the violence by climbing walls. The genocide lasted from April to July 1994, a brutal period when extremists from the Hutu majority planned to wipe out the Tutsi minority and anyone who opposed them. About 200,000 Hutu, driven by media propaganda, joined in. Rwanda's major ethnic groups are the Hutu, who make up over 80% of the population, and the Tutsi, about 15%. A smaller group, the Twa, makes up less than 1%. All three groups speak Kinyarwanda, showing they've lived together for centuries. On the evening of April 6, 1994, a plane carrying the Rwandan and Burundian presidents was shot down over Kigali, killing everyone on board. Although it was initially thought that Hutu extremists were responsible, later allegations pointed to the RPF. The next day, Hutu extremists began killing Tutsi and moderate Hutu. Prime Minister Agatha Uwilingiamana was assassinated, along with 10 Belgian UN soldiers guarding her. This violence aimed to eliminate moderate leaders and create a power vacuum for a new extremist government led by Colonel Teoneste Bagosora. On April 8, 1994, Theodore Sindikubwabo became interim president, and the new government took office on April 9, 1994. The following months were marked by chaos and mass killings. Hutu militia groups like the Interahamwe and Impuzamugambi were heavily involved. Radio broadcasts encouraged Hutu civilians to attack Tutsi calling them cockroaches that needed to be exterminated. Brutal methods were used, including machetes and rape, with some attackers deliberately spreading HIV AIDS to Tutsi women. The UN, which had peacekeepers in Rwanda, tried but failed to mediate. On April 21, 1994, it decided to reduce the peacekeeping force from 2,500 to 270, a move criticized as inadequate. By May 17, 1994, the UN authorized a new force of 5,500 troops, mostly from African nations, but they were not immediately deployed. On June 22, 1994, a French-led force, Operation Turquoise, was sent to establish a safe zone, though the RPF opposed it, accusing France of supporting the old government. The RPF, which had rejected the extremist government, resumed fighting and captured most of the country by early July, taking Kigali on July 4, 1994. The extremist leaders fled, and by July 19, 1994, a new transitional government was in place with Hutu Pasteur Bizamungu as president and Tutsi Paul Kagame as vice president, ending the genocide. The genocide, often described as lasting 100 days, resulted in the deaths of over 800,000 people. About two million fled, mostly to Eastern Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but many returned to Rwanda by late 1996 and early 1997. Afterward, Rwanda focused on reconciliation, recovering, and prosecuting those responsible for the atrocities. Number one, Soviet spy execution, Finland. This 1942 photograph from East Karelia, Finland, released to the public in 2006, shows a Soviet spy who is laughing at the person about to execute him just before he is shot. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were key figures in one of the most debated spy cases in American history. Their trial and execution in 1953 for giving atomic secrets to the Soviet Union sparked intense debate and curiosity. Looking back, the outcome almost seems unavoidable. After World War II, the alliance between the Allies and the Soviet Union quickly fell apart. 
the two superpowers emerged with conflicting beliefs and interests. In the U.S., fears of Soviet aggression and the spread of communism created a climate of paranoia known as the Red Scare. Against this background, on June 19, 1953, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were executed in the electric chair at New York's Sing Sing Prison. They were the first and only American citizens to be executed for spying during peacetime. Their journey from ordinary citizens to infamous spies began in the 1930s. Born to poor immigrant families in New York City, they became involved in left-wing politics during the Great Depression. Julius, an electrical engineer, and Ethel, an aspiring singer and actress who gave up her dreams to become a housewife, were committed communists. Julius joined the Young Communist League in 1936 and met Ethel there. By 1942, they had joined the American Communist Party. Julius's expertise led him to work on radar and communications equipment for the Army Signal Corps. Through his connections with the Communist Party, he was recruited by the Soviets to pass on information about U.S. Army research and development, including details about the atomic bomb from the Manhattan Project. This information helped the Soviet Union advance its nuclear capabilities. For eight years, the Rosenbergs passed secrets to the Soviets. Their activities came to light in 1950 when Klaus Fuchs, a German-born physicist who had worked on the atomic bomb projects, was arrested. Fuchs confessed to passing atomic secrets to the Soviets, which led to the uncovering of a larger spy network. This network included Harry Gold, an American chemist and Soviet courier, who identified David Greenglass, Ethel Rosenberg's brother. Greenglass testified that he had given atomic information to Julius and that Ethel had typed his notes. This testimony was crucial in convicting the Rosenbergs, who were swiftly sentenced to death. Despite numerous appeals and public outcry, President Dwight D. Eisenhower refused to grant clemency. The Rosenbergs left behind two young children, Michael and Robert, who were passed through several foster homes before being adopted. As adults, they wrote about their experiences and campaigned against political persecution. Although declassified Soviet documents later confirmed Julius's involvement, Ethel's role remains unclear. Greenglass later admitted that parts of his testimony were false. Many believe Ethel was prosecuted more to pressure Julius than for any substantial spying activities of her own. The Rosenberg case set the stage for Cold War spying and marked the beginning of what would become known as the Golden Age of Espionage. Which of these shocking photos did you find the most intriguing? Let us know your answer in the comments section.